How are you, man? I'm good. How about yourself? Fantastic. Wow, you got sunshine. We don't have anything like that around here. <laughs> it is sunshine and 20 degrees. <laughs> that's Yeah, I think that's what's coming for us tomorrow. Um, it's going to be wicked cold here, which right now it's just kind of dreary and yucky winter kind of. So. Right. Yeah, we had snow last weekend. Um, so it was nothing major. Just it was pretty to look at. I appreciate you inviting me. Hopefully I, I have something of value to every uh, contribute single to. person says that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You will be no different. I promise you. And, and, and you know, it's, it's everyone says, I, I really don't know why you even call me. I, I don't know what I'm going to tell you, but whatever, you know, so I promise you this will turn out great. Welcome to the Vision of Leadership podcast. I'm your host, Ted McElroy. This podcast is dedicated to helping you find your wins, have a better quality of life, and become the best leader you can be. Hey, have you subscribed to this podcast yet? Don't miss an episode. They're worth every single thing you paid for them, which is nothing because they're free. I invite you to subscribe to the podcast by hitting the subscribe button. Give us a rating and a review on your specific podcast player. This helps us with our podcast rankings, and makes it easier for people to find us. And as always, please support those who help support us. Episode 102 of this podcast, Chris interviewed Justin Kwan, Michelle Andrews, and Richard Ruth. They pointed out that as a profession, we have done a great job of letting our patients know that myopia is not a big deal. If you can see 2020, there is no worry. It is the high myopes that are more danger. And as they said, that message is tragic. Any myopia has a higher risk of maculopathy, glaucoma, and earlier cataract development. In the MySight one-day clinical trials, only 4% of study participants who got ProClear one-days stayed stable in their myopia progression over the three-year period. That means you can confidently say, parent, by not going to a system geared to slow the myopia progression, there is a 96% chance your child's vision will get worse. This may take away some of the choice your child has in the future as to how they will correct their vision. Choice not fear of the disease associations with myopia is what best resonates with parents when it comes to myopia control for their children. And with Cooper Vision's MySight One Day, we now have an FDA-approved single-use contact lens to lessen the progression of myopia in our patients. Contact your Cooper Vision representative to find out more about MySight One Day contact lenses. Welcome to the Vision of Leadership podcast. I'm Ted McRoy. Today, I have with me a good friend of mine, Dr. Chris Morris, who is from Rogers, Arkansas. He is in a group practice there. Um, And um, in addition to that, he's had a lot of involvement with uh, organized optometry. He is a leader in our profession and um, has also had his, a lot of his influence in optometry has come from family. His father, Dale, um, was an optometrist, a retired optometrist, I believe now, and um, has also influenced me quite a bit because he was in the volunteer structure at SECO when I was going through with all the things with SECO. In fact, um, one thing that I learned from Dale was just how important that background stuff is. Uh, a lot of us that were out front, you know, yeah, we're getting a lot of the limelight, but what the real work that was going on, the real things that were happening were happening because of people like Dale and uh, just what a great influence he was for me. And I know he was for Chris. So uh, Chris, Thanks. welcome to the podcast. I really appreciate you being here with me today. Absolutely, Ted. Thanks for, for having me. And I look forward to our conversation. Me too. I, 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 let's go ahead and dig into your family legacy in optometry. And, you know, because right now my son, Hank, which everybody probably is tired of hearing me tell this on the podcast, but my son, Hank, is in optometry school. And his, um, his goal in life since he was about five was to be an optometrist. It was my wife one day, I don't know how they got in this conversation, but 
he basically said he wanted to do what daddy did, you know, and it's, it's, what do you mean? She goes, he goes, I want to be an eye doctor like daddy. I want to wear a white coat and white shoes and white pants and a white shirt and a white tie. And I want to get paid $5 a day. And I thought, this is a bargain. I'll, be, I'll take him right now, you know, <laughs> but I mean, was that the same kind of experience you had as far as when you were growing up? Is it something you just, uh, you, I've got to do this, or was it something that you sort of came to later as you went through school? Uh, yeah, I came through, I came to it later. Uh, but what's interesting is I was always around dad's office. Even as a little kid, I'd get dropped off after school and I'd hang out at his office. He started by himself and then ended up joining a doc, uh, who was also in town. And we, I grew up in a small town, East Arkansas. And, um, um, but I was around his office, but what was interesting is I really didn't learn a whole lot about what he did until later. And I, um, after through college, I, I knew I wanted to do something healthcare related, but it wasn't necessarily optometry. And then, but then I eventually came around to, you know what, I think this is what I want to do. And I started to, um, was working a couple of years after college, uh, just trying to decide what I wanted to do and started talking to my dad more seriously about what he did. And, um, but I'd witnessed it growing up, but I didn't fully appreciate it till later. And I guess one of the things was just the broad scope of care he was able to provide the relationship he had with his patients. And then also thought about, you know, he was always at my baseball games. He was always available being a practice owner. And, and so those things started to, you know, influence my decision. And then, um, and so I decided to go into optometry school and um, went to Southern college, um, uh, which is where my dad went as well. And what's crazy is I had a, I was in, they, they did yearbooks back then when dad was in school. And I was, I was in the yearbook at SEO and when he was a junior and then I had my first child, my daughter as a junior at SEO. So it's kind of weird how that all circled back around. So, yeah, it's what's the, what's the, uh, thing I think that, uh, Twain said history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme, you know, yes. so I- <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, so, so how did, um, how do you think that, I mean, other than, you know, having a little bit of exposure to it, what did, what did your dad, how did he, how did he influence the doctor you became? That's a great question. Um, you know, he was, I would hear him tell stories about patients. And one thing that stands out, I remember there was a patient that um he actually provided his care, not for cash, but it was a, a local guy, a farmer who paid for his care in, in some food. And I remember having a dinner one night and our entire meal was this patient that had essentially paid for his care with his um, produce. And, uh, and that stood out to me just, I think, you know, my dad always just was really good at developing relationships with patients. And it was, it was always about that. And I, I got to hear stories, but then I also saw him on the, on the side of advocating for the profession. And, and, um, I have memories of conference calls back in the day when it wasn't like what we're doing, it was a dial in number and he would he would be on a call with several docs from around the state and he'd say, Hey, Chris, come here. You want to listen in? And just the thought that like 10 people could be on the same phone call kind of blew my mind at that time. And so they were talking through, you know, some of their legislative stuff then. And, um, and so he modeled the, you know, involvement and service to the profession as well as just uh, relationships with his patients. And so I always thought I would love to have that in my career. If I could have those kind of relationships like he has with his patients and then, you know, provide a service that would be, I think, fulfilling. And and so, and then I have been able to do that. So that was a big influencer. 
do you think those type of relationships are easier to cultivate now back then, or it's about the same? I think it's more difficult uh, now um, because of the time we have with our patients. Um, We have a shorter period of time to connect with them has been my experience. And that's, I'm about to, well, the summer will be ending my 23rd year in practice, which is hard to believe. But uh, even over my time, I, I saw, of course, fewer volume of patients when I started than I am now. And so um, even my uh, senior partner that I uh, joined here in Rogers, he talks about the days when he saw a patient an hour, you know, and he had all kinds of time to, to spend with them. And now, you know, that time is, is, is not, is more of a premium. So. So what do you do to cultivate the relationships that you are building with them? How, how do you get past? I mean, because yeah, we're, our time is a lot more finite now. So what kind of things are you doing to build those relationships? It's, you know, from the, just providing care, I like to just say, Hey, um, whether it's an established patient or a new patient, um, you know, I like to get to the bottom of how can I help you today? You know, what is your, what is your expectation of our time? Um, and, and then, you know, tell me how you spend your day. How do you, what's your work day? Like, what's your, what do you do when you play your family time and just trying to establish a connection that way. And that tells me about how I can help them clinically, but, but then also creates conversation where we can connect, you know, personally too. And when you're having these connections with people, how does that influence the way that you go about making your recommendations to them? uh, The way they accept those recommendations what do you, what do you feel like that? How do you, how do you, how does that affect those kind of things? Um, well, for instance, um, and I think I've learned this too from, you know, the Essilor does an experts program. I know you're aware of that where it says, you know, talk human, um, and just finding out, you know, um, you know, what do you like to do for fun, you know, recreation, you know, your work day. And then I can, can then prescribe related to that. You know, it's like, you know, mountain biking is big up here in our area now and has become kind of a destination for that. And so I'll ask, you know, Hey, I can, I've got a solution for you when you're on the trails where we can really get you seeing Chris, but we can give you the protection as well. And so, um, you know, not talking technical terms, you know, AR and polarized and progressive, but just, you know, talking, you know, let's, let's enhance your, your days on the trails. But, you know, when you're in the office, you know, I can get you seeing well and comfortable throughout your day, those types of conversations, um, talking human, I guess, which I've appreciated that recommendation from, from the Essilor training. So you also said that your dad was a big influence on you on, in advocacy. Yes. Um, and so how do you, what kind of, uh, influence did he give to you? How did you further take that influence and, and make it work for you? So the, in Arkansas, and I know many other States and really optometry in general is really a tight knit family. Um, and, um, and that was certainly true in Arkansas. And so I would go to meetings state meetings with him and I would meet other doctors and I would see them interacting. And, you know, he did a really good job of telling me about just the, just the reality and optometry that we had to advocate for our privileges to provide care. And, you know, and I saw that um, in action and then, and just the, success of that really comes back to relationships. So with the legislature and how we had to build relationships with them so that they fully understood who we were professionally and are professionally and why what we were asking for was 
was legitimate and needed, you know, for the public. And so um, that, you know, I, I, I saw that not only modeled by him, but, but other, you know, colleagues of his that I got to know from around the state, you know, that were actively involved in that. And, and they you, passed. you've been right. involved with the Arkansas Optometric Association throughout your career. Uh, what, right. what type of roles have you taken with, with the association? When I first started, I got involved in education um, right out of school. I was, i got on the education committee would would and really got involved in planning our education events so that was my first um role and then um was asked to then uh join the um board of directors um um, ended up moving through the the board chairs ultimately was was president of the of our state association that was in 2008 2009 mm-hmm. um and uh and then have continued to be involved on the legislative committee both state and national committee and um um and so in the legislative committee i got involved in early after doing education planning as well and so um, um, those have been my main roles. Um, and currently most of that is, uh, is on the legislative committee now. So with being in the legislative committee, obviously you're in, in tune with exactly what your initiatives are for legislation that are moving forward. Do you feel like, uh, well, how do you feel like it's changed from what your, how you go about doing it now? to what you were doing when you first got started or has it changed at all? Um, Is it easier? Is it harder? What are your thoughts on those things? The, uh, you know, the secret to it, and I think across the country for optometry has been, you know, just the commitment to having relationships with our legislators. So they, they know who we are personally and they can trust us and that you just can't, I mean, you can't replace that. Um, and that has become more difficult, um, because, uh, members of the legislature do change more often. Now, uh, we have term limits here in Arkansas where before you had people that were, you know, members who were there longer. So your relationship, um, um, you weren't having to build new relationships a lot of times, and that can be good and bad both ways, but, um, So, I mean, that, that's a huge thing. Um, and just that grassroots, um, effort and everybody, but it, it's most effective when you have the more people you have involved, then it can be, you know, I have one, maybe two relationships that I need to be fostering and, and building. And so when it's time to take action, it's easier to motive, you know, mobilize, you know, the troops, so to speak. Um, you know, from passing legislation, you know, across the board, whether it's us or anybody else, you know, the, um, and for our issues that have always been at least met with resistance, uh, obviously, um, from the OMD side, um, you know, nowadays in Arkansas, you have to essentially put out your intentions ahead of time. Um, and, and so there's more time for them to, um, you know, essentially talk against you where in the past that, that was not required. And so the time frame involved, um, was shorter, you know, where you could, you know, take action on your, on your issue. Um, and so that's, that's created a little bit of resistance, but honestly, um, you know, that's not a bad thing. I think ultimately that's good because regardless of the issue, you know, I think I would want my legislature to know about things ahead of time, even on other issues rather than being surprised by them. So, right. Um, well, as you, as you were, y'all were going to uh, move toward your laser bill, which I don't think there's anybody in the country who doesn't know what, you know, what kind of hurdle that was for you guys. 
but kind of take me through the process of how that started out, uh, how much planning went into it to begin with. Um, and then the, the challenge after you pass the bill and you get it signed and then you basically almost get it yanked away from you again. Take me through that. Yeah. So, you know, it had been 20 years since we had been to our legislature for any major scope change. And so, but we had talked about it, gosh, we've been talking about it for 15 years. Um, we, we really started getting serious. I would say it was probably about five or six years ahead of the 2019 session. Um, I forget exactly when Kentucky uh, was able to pass their law, but we had visited with them and then, then came Louisiana, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, after them. And so, um, you know, in terms of education, getting our members pursuing, you know, uh, certification and education for, you know, to be prepared for providing that care. And then, um, and then really uh, developing um, relationships with our legislators and then giving them a little heads up on on what we were looking at doing, particularly the ones that we knew would be fighting for us. And so, um, and so going into the fall of 2019 or 2018, uh, we had to present our, you know, had to write language, present it to the committee, what they call an interim study Mm -hmm. committee. You had to look at that. That was like November, 2018, our session didn't start until uh, February of 19. Um, and so, and during that time, you know, our statewide membership was laying the groundwork with our legislators to raise support for the issue. And, and we had, you know, we had support for what we, that we needed in both, you know, the house and the Senate. Um, and then start, then began the process. And of course, the first thing is, uh, house public health. And, uh, um, you know, we had generations of optometrists there, you know, all of my dad's crew and, and then the others since then we'd had four, you know, major scope changes over the years. This was going to be number five. And, uh, we had never been unsuccessful in any step of the process, uh, including a committee, um, um, we get to this committee, we, it was, well, what an experience we had. One of our main, uh, opponents is, a um, ophthalmologist retina doc that was on the committee. Of course, he naturally spoke against it. Um, and all that being said, that first committee hearing, we, we, we failed in committee by, I believe one, two votes. Right which was crazy discouraging. I remember walking out of the room and one of our friends on the house uh, looked at me and he's like, Hey man, this is not over. I said, what do you mean? We just, we just lost. He says, you can come back. And he says, you can, you can come back. I was like, and in my mind, I had personally, was not thinking that way. And so, and that's exactly what we did. We went and some of the issues that, swayed the vote we we amended it we amended the bill we made some concessions on a couple of things and um and then we passed the house uh committee um um, the frustrating thing in addition to this was our opponents decided to introduce legislation i think more of as a um, just to occupy us or deter our efforts of trying to actually introduce legislation to allow opticians to prescribe glasses and contacts. And they presented two different bills immediately. Their, their numbers were only were right behind our bill number. I think we were 1252 and they were 1254 and five. Wow. And so we had to, so we had to immediately defend that the legislature saw the reality of what was going on and we were able to 
but that that was just another little thorn in our side that that came up from that um but then we we got through health committee um our house floor votes were like 70 to 19 um then we had onto the senate um that was the most lengthy um committee that went for five hours it was it was grueling um got out of senate committee uh, one senate that like i want to say 28 to 5 or something like that but so we've got the law in place it's march april um you know and we're excited about the success and then in june we hear about the um ballot initiative which it was a learning experience for me i was like wait how is this possible and so basically any law that's passed if enough people uh if you get enough signatures to challenge a law that that can actually happen. Now, this had not been done on a bill like ours ever in history, to my knowledge. And so, um, but our opponents created a ballot committee. They and then started um, canvassing the state to overturn our law. And so. So here we go again, and we're having to defend that law to the public uh, because even the canvassing that was done was very misleading. In fact, one of the canvassing spots, when you went up to it, they would say, hey, would you sign our petition? And then and it said, and if you asked, well, what's this about? Well, this is to keep um, optometrists from doing cataract surgery and LASIK. And we're like, wait. That wasn't even in the bill, not even mentioned. And so the way they were presenting it to the public was exaggerating and just completely misleading. Right. Um, and so, so they ultimately were able to get technically the signatures, but we challenged the validity of it. And that went through a year and a half. Well, See, that was um, that was summer 19, so it went all the way to summer 2020, um, and um, it went before the Supreme Court of the state, and um, I don't remember all the details, but ultimately that ballot initiative was, was ruled to be, um, um, I guess, invalid um but that's leading up to the um 2020 elections we've got covid going on all of these meetings are all virtual even the hearings and court proceedings that were going on which was a huge challenge we're raising money to to get ready for a basically a pr campaign to defend our law um, in the 2020 election because ultimately the public was going to vote on this law. Um, and so of actually keeping it in place. Um, and so, um, so you had all the mail-in ballot stuff going on for the general election and they're having to prepare ballots ahead of time. Right. So the Supreme court had not ruled yet, but they were already preparing ballots. So our initial, our issue was going to be on the ballot regardless. And so what ended up happening was after the ballots were created, Supreme Court rules, you know, strikes that issue from the ballot, but it's technically still on there. So we had patients all through the fall that that 2020 last year. Hey, what's this thing I'm seeing on the ballot? How's, you know, and, uh, of course, we were telling them about it and had been, but then, hey, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's, it's been, you know, it was uh, been struck from the ballot. And so um, long story short, further is after it was done, I think there were several, we didn't think it was going to be reported, but we actually saw some reports from uh, certain counties and we, we, we're winning even on the public <laughs> vote. 
uh, like 60 to 40 or, you know, on some of the reports, even though we were told they wouldn't be reporting results on that particular issue. So, um, so fortunately we were able to uh, defeat that and, and the, um, but knowing that we even had the public behind us uh, ultimately was, was, was certainly uh, um, felt good too. So um, the long battle, I never knew that the ballot initiative would even be a common issue. Um, and it might actually be again. Um, uh, we'll have to see. We might have to defend it again. So, um, but um, yeah, and docs around the state um, are already have put it into play this year and, and they're, you know, been able to provide care to patients that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. And it's, um, it's been, you know, which is ultimately the, the whole issue is, is providing the care that's needed, the care we're trained to do. Um, and, uh, and so even our practice, we are going to be bringing in new technology to, to engage those things this year as well. So, you know, one of the things that's about this, it's not that, you know, it's not the capability that's an issue. It's not the education that's the issue. It's the public view of what the issue is. And by public, it's not just rank and file. It's, I mean, let's face it, legislators are part of the public, you know, and, and they're making those yeah. decisions upon the, from the public. So you've got to be able to influence them in the right way to get the right thing. So it's got to feel good knowing that this sort of straw poll, for instance, that you got by accident, you know, lets you know, you got a 60, 40 chance of pulling the sucker off if you were to get challenged. However, I can't imagine the expense this must have been, how, how expensive it must have been to, to go through that process after you've already gone through the expense of actually getting it done the first time. Um, it was huge. And um, I mean, we were literally raised, you know, upwards of a couple million dollars or more just to fight the PR campaign that we ended up not having to fight because it was, but we had to still prepare for that. Yeah. And, you know, I talked about this with, with my partners and other committee members. I said, think about this. Think about the money that we're investing in this, that we are all on an issue that we're already legitimately qualified to provide, but we're having to spend this kind of money to make it happen when we could be investing this in our practices and our patient care. I mean, and the, honestly, our opponents spending the money they're doing to fight it when they, when we should be working together to take care of patients, not against each other. It's just, it's, you know, when you really look at it from a big picture, that's the frustrating part. And actually one of our opponents, he was a um, uh, ER physician on the committee. I remember having a conversation with him and even though he was going to be against us technically on the boat, he says, you know, he was a new member of the legislature and he says, you know, the fact that members of the legislature, like you said, who are members of the public, who are not, who we're having to really educate significantly so they can make an informed decision. He said, the fact that they're making a decision on how physicians and doctors take care of people is really seems a little odd. Why, why that is the way this is going. He said, you know, people that don't really know as much about it are, are actually ultimately in charge of making that decision. And so, um, and it's, you know, it's, um, but that's the battle we have to, that's the process we have to go through. But even he was like, you know, recognizing just, just the, that didn't really sound right to him, even that that's the be the way that this would go. So, so what do you feel like has been the real, I mean, other than you, you guys won, but what is, what, what other pot, what is all this made possible for you guys because you went through this? Well, one it's, you know, practicing to our, to our fullest level of education, which was the issue of, with you know my dad's generation like i've been trained to do this but technically the law says i can't do it um and now we can provide even more broad scope of care to our patients 
in a state like ours, who's a lot of rural communities where access to this care is more difficult, it, it now removes that barrier. Um, and, and honestly, the next generation of optometrists, it, it, you know, I came out of school with privileges that are only possible because of the previous generation's work. And that's influenced my entire career so far. And now, um, you know, we're just paving the way for the next generation to be able to step out into the real world and, 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 you know, put to, put to work all the things they've learned. And um, um, so I think that's what's, what's most critical, you know, on the professional side. And then, you know, patients are getting, um, you know, access to, you know, great care. Yeah. So you talked about the generations of, of optometrists and right now you're having a chance to influence our next generation of optometrists uh, through a mentorship program that you're doing with conjunction between uh, SCO and vision source. How's that program going? What's, what are you getting out of it? Um, and, and how do you feel about our profession because of it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been very rewarding. And I, I, you know, the, the few sessions that we've, we've had so far have really helped to me even just think back to um, my first days in practice and, you know, what, what kind of advice would I have wanted, you know, 20 years ago and what can I give today? And so it's been, it's been fun to share my experience, just things I've learned, things I've not done well to things that I did well. And most of what I did well was because I had good advice and a a good example. And so um, to be on this side of, of, you know, providing an example has been, has been certainly uh, fun to do and rewarding. And I think is, you know, we've got to do more of this for sure. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're in, in essence teaching in a certain extent, but what yeah. have you learned out of this process? Um, I think really what I've learned is that it's not about, um, and I've learned this in my practice as well. It's, it's really about what am I, what value am I offering to not just my patients, but my team around me that makes them better at what they do. Um, and I think it's more just a leadership learning a little bit, you know, it's, it's not be about being in charge or responsible for the results. It's about, it's about um, um, giving the people around me and whether it's a mentee or a, a young doc, you know, the, the tools they need to be successful. And so, um, and so kind of that servant mindset, servant leader mindset, I think that's really what, I've learned through that process and have, have been learning even in the, in recent years in practice of having that mindset uh, more than um, feeling like I'm have to be in charge or fully responsible for the results of, of the outcome of practice or a mentor relationship. So is there anything specific you can go back and look at that actually you've learned directly from your mentee? Um, I think that in talking with her, the, um, it's really just seeing, learning what her perspective is on what practice life might look like. And so that, that, which looks totally different than what it was when I was coming out. And so the opportunities are greater. And so honestly, I think it's even, there's more opportunity now for them than there was even for my generation. And so their decision, I think they have to grow up in their professional mindset a little faster. Um, Even during school to, to start to think about, okay, what, 
what type of practice setting do I want it to be in? What, what kind of leader am I going to be? Not just, not just a competent doctor, but, but developing skills to lead people around me. Um, and I, 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 I've sensed that from our conversations, you know, that it's, it's more than just the demand of optometry school. It's thinking about the other responsibilities that come with this. I think they're already, it seems like they're already thinking about that maybe more than I was back then. So you just said a minute ago, and I just want to go back. You said something about, uh, to the phrase of the, all the great opportunities they've got ahead of us, of them, that would also presume that we have those same opportunities ahead of us. Would it not? Right. But yet we hear a lot, maybe, maybe it's just me. I hear a lot of our colleagues talking about all the constraints that keep getting put on us. Why, why do you think it's, why do you think your mindset's so different from the rest of our colleagues that are thinking that it's just so restrictive now? I, I used to be, and I, and I still fall into, you know, the, the, to kind of take the bait of looking at it with a glass half, uh, half empty mindset. Um, my wife is a glass half full person. I tend to be the glass half empty, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm learning to change my mindset about that. And, you know, I think, I think it's in our DNA as optometrists because we've had to be so um, proactive on just defending our ability to do what we do that we tend to be, um, on the defensive side of things, uh, about watching out for threats while we try to move forward. And, and so whether it's just, uh, some of the challenges of vision plan and other things that res- we feel like restrict us, um, um, I think just learning to look at it as an opportunity, it, it's kind of like with this new, uh, beauty product. Some may think, well, that's going to take away from from our optical but it's like no it's an opportunity actually to offer um you know more options to our patients it's not necessarily taking away from something it just it's an opportunity and so um and of course i'm always gonna like you gonna really preach the value of private practice and would love that every new grad would have a private practice opportunity because that's that's where practicing optometry is most fulfilling, but also the quality of care is just, you know, it's just better across the board. So um, um, I think if private practice optometrists don't give new docs opportunities, that's where it could be, you know, restricting them uh, from, from a more fulfilling life of practice. And that's not for everybody, but I think ultimately that's, that's good for optometry. It's good for our new optometrists and it's good for our patients. So, um, yeah, we just, um, that's been another big thing for me is that I would like to participate in that, um, in in making that possible. So, so you, you brought up beauty. Um, have you had a lot of people come and ask you directly about it? Patients that have said, Hey, what do you know about this new, Presby, well, I don't say that, that new, this new eye drop to help me see better up close with, I mean, have you had anybody come and ask you that directly? Yes, we have. Um, even some friends just calling me, Hey, what's, what's this mean? And, um, but what's interesting is just in talking with patients, I feel like there's the majority don't know. And so I think it's our, our job to at least make them aware. Cause I would much rather them know it, hear it from me than from someone else. And so that's kind of been my approach to it is particularly that, you know, those early Presby open, you know, those 40 year olds, uh, which unfortunately I am not a member of anymore. So, (laughs) Uh, but um, yeah, I, I've been like, I would rather them hear it from me than uh, like, well, I wonder why Chris didn't tell me about that. So, yeah. And that's, that's the same kind of philosophy I have as well. And it was kind of funny. I mean, through the on the business of optometry um, 
email threads that I'm sure you probably watched that Vision Source has got going on. And there was this large conversation about everything. And I'm sitting there thinking, I, nobody's even come and talked to me about these things yet. I haven't had a rep come and say anything to me. And about two weeks into all the discussion of everybody, I've tried this, I've tried that. The rep walks in the day, you know, that day. And uh, he leaves me three bottles is all he's left. <laughs> and it was almost like, I thought he had called a couple of people um, in my community to say, Hey, go into his office today. I just dropped those off because that was the first day anybody said one single word to me as a patient about this drop. And I just happened to have the three bottles right there, you know? So I gave them out. Well, I gave two of the bottles out. Uh, one lady, um, you know, dropped her in the office. I dropped every, both of them in the office to see how it was going to work. And the first lady was, you know, well, this is kind of cool. I mean, I, you know, and, you know, and then I called her back about a week later after she'd been choosing it. And she said she was getting pretty good results with it. You know, she was, um, functioning well, she could, you know, she knew it wasn't going to be an all day kind of thing, but she could see where this fit in a little bit better than maybe using her glasses for certain things, you know, and, um, she really didn't want to get into contact lenses. Then I had another lady who happens to be, um, one of the attorneys at our hospital here in town. And she had heard about it and I said, yeah, well, we can give it a shot. Well, she had some distance RX issues and I said, it's not going to be great for that part of it, you know, so you're probably would be better off to have some single vision lenses to put on. So I gave her a couple of those to take with her some, some dailies to use. And, uh, her experience was way the opposite. She said, I'd put it in about two hours later. I've got nothing going, you know, and she said then, except for all the side effects, as far as like, everything seems dim and I can't see really well. So what I have found, and I tried it on myself too. And I got some results for about probably four hours, five hours. And I put in some single vision lenses to help out with my distance vision. And it wasn't terrible. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't great. I wasn't expecting it to be, you know, life altering, but I have to say, you know, it's, I can see where it fits in and how it would work and, um, how it would have some benefit. So just like you, I'm going to make sure I talk about it, you know, especially with the emerging presbyopes. So they understand that there's something else out there because you're right. The last thing you want to know is, well, why didn't Ted say that to me? I mean, you know, but I, you know, this friend of mine down the street, their doctor said something about it. So I guess I'll just go see them next time. Exactly. Right. We, uh, one of my partners had a um, lady try it recently and she, and her response was, I've, I haven't seen this good since my twenties. I mean, wow. and then I also had a guy that was like, you know, this is helping me. I, I, it's definitely making a difference. I don't know if it's going to be everything I need. Um, having a few side effects, you know, the headache, the, the redness to my eyes and, and that sort of thing. But um, so it really, it, it really just is another, it's another tool in the toolbox that quite frankly, I think particularly with our contact lens patients could be just an adjunct, you know, those that are really preferring contact lenses, but they need, you know, they need this, this could be a way to make that experience, you know, more complete. So um, um yeah. And then all the other products that are in the pipeline, be really curious to see. Oh yeah. Uh, especially that lens softener. That's the, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, curious to see what that turns into, but um, you know, one thing I was thinking about, I don't know if I mentioned talking about our law, just what it is that the privileges or the um, in that, I don't think I talked to that just, um, and so, you know, we were, um, it includes a uh, YAG laser. So for capsulotomies, um, SLT, um, uh, we, we have privileges for, you know, lumps and bumps, um, you know, at uh, type lesions, uh, with a, a few restrictions, obviously, you know, nasal to the puncta, that's, um, those types of things are not allowed. And then of course, anything that we do from a from a lesion perspective has to be um, sampled and sent for um, histology. And so um, uh, injections um, um, are allowed, not, not intraocular obviously, but um, uh, everything but intraocular. So, um, so those, we did take out um, peripheral ir iridotomy. That's one of the things we conceded on on the law and um, 
Um, and then we do have to report on our, when we do procedures, we report to the health department on, on the procedures and outcome. So right. as a, as an oversight. So, but still the exposure, uh, the, excuse me, the expansion of your law, making your state a, a much more heck desirable place to go as a, for a new grad, because, you know, now you've got the opportunity to truly practice your full scope of licensure. Um, yeah. it's, it's going to be a really nice thing for Arkansas. I hope you guys have got enough room for everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the bad part yeah. is we're going to be losing out, uh, and these others, all the rest of us are going to be losing out on not being able to get those people to come to us. Oh, um, you know, and, it, and it's already hard enough trying to find an OD as it is, you know, um, and it's just a, it's an incredible, we, we, you know, you think there's way too many, but really there's, there's not a surplus out there. Uh, I think that, that, you know, the amount of places to go and the so few that really are graduating every year, it's, 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 uh, it's going to be a difficult thing coming for us very soon, especially if those of us who own practices, aren't like you said, being welcoming to these new grads who truly want an opportunity in private practice. Well, what's, what's been really encouraging to see is how other States, these, you know, this past year, even with Mississippi, um, I believe it was at Montana, um, Alaska. Um, I know Alabama's doing some things, so hopefully we'll start to see, you know, that momentum build in other States where as this is being, successful and safely done, you know, it, it just, um, it can start to happen across the country. So, um, so that it's not, you know, docs have more choice even, you know, in, in being able to practice to full scope, full, full scope. So, um, well, I promise you, I was going to get you out of here on time because you've got something you've got to do here in about 30 minutes, but, um, I want to, First of all, I would like to know if there's one thing that you want to leave, make sure you leave this audience with as you go away. What What's the one thing they need to hear from Chris Morris? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, man. Um, you know, with, with the challenges that we've had the past two years, um, you know, I think back, gosh, we're almost two years from the shutdown. And I remember navigating that not only just, okay, some fear of the unknown, taking care of our team around us. Uh, we started back and I think I've been working harder now since uh, June, 2020 until now than I ever did prior. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's, I, I think, well, two things. One, I'm more grateful for, you know, my opportunity to practice optometry, you know, and just um, the, the state of the profession and, and the level of care we're, we're able to provide. It's rewarding, even on those days where you're like, man, that was tough. I don't know if I want to do that again. But, and then the challenge of leading our teams, you know, it's, um, I've learned a lot there uh, because um, I think our, you know, I've definitely learned our biggest asset are the people around us. You know, we've been um, committed to technology and trying to be cutting edge and all that, but um, I've really been convicted about being a better, you know, leader of our teams and making sure they're fulfilled by the work they do and, and that they feel safe at, you know, and that we have a culture in our office that is, you know, you know, locking arms rather than just punching the clock and coming to work, you know. And so, um, so that's been a, a big thing. And, you know, honestly, for me, you know, you know, I'm, just to be even more transparent, you know, I struggled um, with anxiety through some of this even more recently. And, just all the responsibility of, of doing business since the pandemic and coming out of and, and living with it now, um, uh, of just, you know, um, just being honest with myself and not just grinning and bearing it and kind of talking about that 
uh, not only with family, but colleagues and just realizing that we have a lot on our plates, but we also have a big opportunity to be influencers of the people around us, our patients and our community. And I think that's, that's kind of what I've come out of this with is a little more of a motivation to, you know, it's not about me, you know, it's how, how can I, how can I bring other people along to do what we do, uh, build relationships with staff, with patients, and then, you know, influence the, you know, our community around us. So, um, and I think, as optometrists, we have a unique ability to do that just with the way we practice day to day with the time we spend with our patients. The, you know, the, I think we're more intentional. And so I would hope um, that, that my colleagues out there would, would be grateful for that opportunity and then, um, you know, and just do everything we can to make that available to the next generation. I think that's, that's, uh, um, I think that's one of my big MOs now. So, you know, for a guy who calls himself a glass half empty kind of guy, you sure to use the word opportunity a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Chris, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And, uh, I know this was, uh, great for the audience, but I, I can't tell you how much it means to me. And, uh, I really, uh, I can't wait to see you face to face real soon. Hopefully. Man, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to do that. So, hey, thanks again for having me, and uh, I look forward to catching up soon. Hey, what does that sign behind your head right there say on the wall? Oh, this was something my wife did. Can you May this that? new year be filled with love, gentleness, and hope. That's amazing. That's great. I should have, well, I'll throw that at the end somehow, but that, that's great. I love that. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. I got to really take weird... credit for that. That's my hey, wife. You know, right still, there. yeah. Well, hey, she's glass, glass half full. There you go. That's right.